It's not about motivation. When is new discipline? Wake up and win today. <laughs> discipline comes from within. Boxing King Media in association with the Riyadh season. Delighted to be joined by Peter Smith, the head trainer of Kevin Lirana. Uh, a big, big uh, fight for your guy. He was kind of been in the security for the last uh, you know, year or so since the Daniel Dubois fight, but he's, he's back in the mix with a big, big opportunity. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. Um, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, we've, uh, you know, Kevin and I have walked a long road in, in this game and uh, where we are right now is, is just exactly where we need to be. Um, this opportunity represented itself and, um, you know, Kevin and I just said, looked at each other and said, should we, because we had this opportunity of the bridge weight, um, WBC title. Um, so we just thought, of, thought of ourselves, why not? This is a make of boxing right now. And uh, for us, we've like trained very hard to get to this moment. We really like working ourselves to hopefully, even if we showcase as heavyweights one day, Kevin's got the ability now. He's groomed to a point where he's got the skills and the mindset. He's well trained. He's in the game. He's, st he's very disciplined. So we, we, we got a good connection, a good um, you know, way of moving forward. And we got a lot of faith and belief in this fight that it's going to do good for us. Um, you know, fights are fights. You know, anybody, nobody can say any fight is hard or I mean, easy. Um, so, yeah, we prepared and looking good. You've been with uh, Kevin literally from the start of his career from, you know, he said he's had no amateur fights and you've been with him since he was like 18 years old. Mm. Um, one some, Something I picked up from uh, Justice, uh, his team, they said that he was at the back end of his career. D do you think he's at the back end of his career or, you know, wh where is he uh, with his career, Kevin, right now? No ways. Um, back end of your career, I think, you know, once you've hit that pinnacle of, you know, being there, done it, you know, it's like that's kind of your back end of your career. Um, where Kevin is right now, he's trying to, f he's finding his feet right now. So he's at the place where this is where he needs to be, this is where he wants to be. So the urge is greater. I think it's, it's more about the urge and how bad you want it. Um, age is not a factor, especially not in the heavyweight division. I mean, Zhang is 40 and uh, he's doing incredibly well. Um, I think it's more your mindset and how you live your life in this game. Mm -hmm. You know, you live a good, clean life. You can go far in this game and you know kevin doesn't get hit that easy you know he's very well groomed and well schooled in the game so he's he's he makes the fights harder and um if i've watched if i look back at his career and what we've done um you know he's really become unblemished uh you know he's just he's really he's ripening right now so i think it's perfect time if I was to ask you for an outcome in this fight, you know, you've ultimately got a, an 18-0, 24-year-old against you know, somebody who's had 32 fights, which is a lot of fights, and he's 31, so realistically on paper, it looks like he's hitting his prime against a, a young guy who on paper probably still doesn't have that much experience in the pro game compared to Kevin, but obviously his team are very confident. Uh, if he was to just make a call on the fight and uh, what you want to happen, but what do you really think is going to happen? You know the way the way we've been working and 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 planning our, our, this fight um, for myself and Kevin, we we know what we need to do. So I think any given moment, I, 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 it's going to be a it's fight where um, I find Kevin's going to find his good place, and once he sets his his ga the game plan in, I think Huni's going to be in for for quite a night of of boxing. He's not going to be like the other eight guys that he fought. Um, you know, Kevin's got the speed, he's got the agility. Um, if you're asking me for a prediction, I think Kevin might do a, a stoppage in this fight. I think he's going to do a stoppage. When? I can't predict that right now. When the bell goes, I can kind of see how the fight's planning out. That's my role, you know, um, to work on the plan and then obviously him and I go forward. We kind of work through each round by round. Hopefully we get to the place where we need to get to and what we planned on. But I, I think it's going to be a good fight. I think it's going to be a very good fight. How, how do you deal with this side of things? Because I, I asked Kevin this when I interviewed him on Zoom a few weeks ago. Because when he fought Daniel Dubois, no one in Britain really heard of Kevin Lorana. And at the mm -hmm. time, everyone just looked at his record and thought, oh, he's just been brought here for an easy, get busy win. 
but it was completely opposite that. You know, I mean, he was it seconds away from winning the fight, uh, and obviously what happened happened. But he showed that he belongs at that level. Um, so what's it like this time? When in reality, everyone knows Kevin is good and he can really fight, and this is a proper fight on paper. So um, you know, just tell me the two emotions as a coach. Uh, how was that to deal with? Well, you know, put it this way: if I go back, and and obviously the result is a result. Um, my personal belief and what I, what I believed, what we did in the planning of that fight with Dubois, I believe Kevin was going to stop Dubois from the plan. I think more so Kevin was more shocked at what he did so early because he was expecting more from Dubois from the early rounds. And I saw, from a coach's point, I saw a mind shift by the second round. I was like, what's going on here? But I think Kevin was actually on, on that platform, you must remember, we were, I can't remember how many people there were, 70, 60,000, whatever. I think just being on that big stage and that element of where he was and what he did, kind of like never sunk in. Um, I think that that maturity of being there in that environment wasn't set in, in his, you know, and out of home, away from home. So I believed, honestly, I thought Kevin could beat um, Dubois like, Within within the rounds, and we had it we had it going, but um, there was a shift, and and we we looked back and we both scratched our heads, you know, and we go back to the drawing board. So, you know, I feel that um, where we are now, the maturing stage is where Kevin needs to be. You know, that's why I say he's not at the back end of his career; he's actually right in the right place. So we're looking forward to you know the journey moving forward, Yain Saudi. It should be interesting. Uh, I just want to um, get a little bit of background on yourself, Peter, because some people watching this will be what listen to you for the first time. And I, I just got told that you know, obviously, you was a fighter in your own day, and you know, you finished with a record of twenty wins and two losses, and you fought in the nineties. Um, I understand back in the day you you sparred James Tony, so I'm just really curious about that because a lot of people recognise James as what one of the all time greats. Could you tell me what year that was and what what stage of his career he mm. was at when that happened? Yeah, well, I, I, I pretty much lost the world title fight in a funny story because I was campaigning as a heavyweight and um, I got an offer to fight for the world title and I just uh, lost, uh, I just won uh, uh, the South African heavyweight title at that time and I got a call to fight for the, for the cruiserweight title. And unfortunately, you know, the cruiserweight was sitting at 86.7 and I was fighting as heavyweight, but I was given a very short notice on that fight. And I took the fight and I tried to lose the weight. And I was actually the first bridge, um, cruiserweight at 90, at 90 um, kilograms um, to fight for that cruiserweight because I couldn't lose the weight anymore. Pre-medical, I came in at 86, and uh, sorry, 96 kilograms to try and break down and then I took my chances and I went for the fight. I lost the fight. And then, yeah, I immigrated to America after that and um, resetting my career there. And um, in the meantime, I had the greatest trainer of all time. Odell Haley was my trainer. You trained Tony Tubbs. And yeah, this guy was magic. And he turned my whole career around. And in that time, we were working around all the gyms and uh, I ended up being a free roaches gym. And we kind of like met and started working together. And James Tony kept asking for help with sparring partners for sparring. And him and I, because we were gym mates, we became each other's helpers in, in sparring. And one of the one of the greatest one of the greatest fighters of all time. For me to stand in front of a man like that. And it's funny what he said to me. He said, Peter, I don't understand, man. He said, You should be heavyweight champ of the world. And I was actually funny enough in this time period we're talking about where it was a time where the heavies were heavy. Like, yeah, you know, the heavy who, who were the champions at that time? It was Evander, it was Evander, Tyson, it was Lennox, Frank Bruno was still there. Um, she was a devastating top 10 uh, heavyweights. I, I, I was ranked number 10 by NABA in the heavyweights. Um, um, and then I was sitting outside top 10 with the other with the other ranking bodies and then um the other one i worked with was klitschko i helped him for lennox lewis All right. yeah that was a, that was a great training camp we had with him and uh yeah james tony was special really special a great great experience i had with that man um 
to this day, uh, on my books, I had him as one of the greatest of all time. Not because I've experienced that time with him, but what I saw, what he's about, he was... What, what was that like? Because on paper, when people watch his highlights now, it's so hard to land a shot on him, clean shot especially. Uh, did you land many punches in sparring? Yeah, could you share yeah, any stories? I, I was actually a very fast heavyweight. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why James kind of had the respect for me in a way, because, you know, we, we would we would like work together and, you know, we, uh, Justin Fortune was actually there with us as well at that time. But, um, you know, it was, it was actually, Lehman Brewster was actually one of the heavyweights as well. He, we, him and I worked together as what, well. What year was that roughly? Jeez, I think 2000, 2003, somewhere around there. And, um, you know, we were like very, like, it was a very um, intense um, training sessions. We had the discipline factor was, you know, amongst these guys was elite. So, you know, working with all these guys, you know, it just iron sharpens iron, you know. And, um, yeah, we had a great experience. So I had a good time with him. I remember speaking to Mike Tyson once, like a, a bit of the South African link. He told me that Francis Botha was his favourite personal knockout ever. I don't know if you ever knew that or not. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what was his favourite. Yeah, but it, it, was, it, it was amazing because um, the way he turned that fight around, uh, I think Francis, Francois Botha was actually doing very well in that fight. And uh, the way Tyson got rid of him was amazing. Any rivalry between yourself and Francois? Um, no, you know what? Funny enough, when I was younger and I was a South African amateur champion, um, I worked with Franc Francois in, right in the beginning, and he's about t he had about ten pro fights at the time, so we worked together. Then he immigrated to America, and he, and he campaigned from America. Then his career, and then we lost touch. And then basically, when I got to LA, I bumped into him again in the gym, and he was he was doing well. He was doing very well. Well, I think Mike described it as the reason it's his favourite is because when he said when he punched Francois, he goes, he, it was the only punch that he's ever felt through his knuckle and through his body. He goes, that, he goes before he even hit the deck, I knew he was gone. Yeah. Well, the funny thing was that Fra Francois is a very tough guy. Very tough guy. And, and I know he's been with some of the top guys. Um, and I, I even remember with, with him sparring and he was a hard worker and very disciplined, but tough as nails. Mm -hmm. And to put him out like Tyson did was, like Tyson explained it, was devastating. Because that, that, if Mike hit any man like that, I don't care who was standing there, would have been gone, you know? And last thing I want to ask you, just a quick prediction mm -hmm. on, uh, uh, in fact, but forget the prediction, I'm more curious about, you know, you've been South African and you will have read about uh, Francis Ngannou's journey from mm -hmm. how you left Cameroon and walked through the Sahara Desert. Obviously, being from that part of the world, like, can you kind of make people understand out there what he did was how crazy it is what he did and to get to France, basically? You know, that's legendary stuff. You know, you don't hear about those stories. That's type of movie type stuff, you know? Um, what Francis did was, I can understand it coming from Africa because, you know, it's a hard place and there's not much much opportunities given to a lot of us. In so even us, uh, Kevin, I must like that's why nobody heard of us. We campaigning in South Africa, and there's a lot of talent there. Um, the only thing is like you know what Francis did to take himself with no money. I mean, you hear a lot, a lot about these stories, but you don't hear about this amazing victory of how he turned his life around it's actually kind of a miracle i call it a miracle maker um and the man deserves it he's such a he looks i don't know him personally but he looks like an amazing human being you know so he's seen both sides of life so that's what makes it better for him you know just being on the on the 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 bad side of life and how he broke himself through to where he's gained victory and um wealth and whatever he's done it's just amazing what, what he's done because he's really done what most people in africa would dream about you know and they don't get the opportunity but he made the dream come true okay. well look uh, it's been fascinating speaking to you peter and that's like you said i echo them words that you just said there about francis um i've actually forgot to ask kevin about this but the rivalry between south africa and uh, australia is obviously pretty big uh, do, do you watch the cricket at all I, I watch it a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm more rugby orientated. Mm. I'm more into violence, <laughs> the violence sport. But um, did, did you watch that infamous cricket match all them years ago? Obviously, it didn't turn out good for South Africa. I think where they made 400. Yeah, and that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's the most iconic that's game crazy. I can think of. It's crazy. And, and South Africa and Australia are big rivals yeah. in sport. 
which is which makes us kind of like neighbors in a way because you know there's always like rugby going on with South Africa and it's cricket and all the you know all the other sports that we contend with each other but boxing is kind of a um a m- more of a new agenda in sport for us Australia South Africa we don't really I'm sorry Philip Holiday was training with us he lives in Australia and he's actually with the trainer he knows the trainer he's South African he was my stable mate with myself and Corey Saunders oh, shit. yeah so me Corey Saunders Philip Holiday when I was living in South Africa and fighting we were actually stable mates and now Philip's in Australia and he's actually knows the whole team he's actually friends with the whole team so um yeah, it's just interesting news, and in box on the boxing side, it's you know interesting who's going to go forward. Well, having spoke to both camps today, and either bit, both both you guys are surrounded, in both teams are surrounded by nice people, and uh, like I said to Kevin, you know, may the best guy win. It should be an interesting fight. All the best. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Listen, I got a question for you. Where can discipline take you? Discipline points you towards your goals. 